in the middle with Johnny and the Greg. Here I am in the middle. Yep. Um, today we have one of uh, a friend of ours from Whitewater. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought he'd be well. We thought he'd be an interesting guest because the guy seems to have done everything, and his recollection for every <laughs> names, uh, the yeah. details. It's kind of crazy. He he was recalling just tons of names of people like and i'm like i haven't heard that name in 20 years and yeah. you're going oh yeah i remember that guy right so yeah. um his name is darren hafford he right now he is a camera operator or a cameraman right he's a cameraman yeah i believe yeah, yeah. cameraman yeah. for a bunch of reality shows yep. uh we talk about his time in the military how that trend how that moved into uh his love of film and um that industry and how that moved along and then we get into uh his photography which he's mm-hmm. a really good photographer i want to get some of his prints actually and put it up behind the wall yeah, that'd be cool yeah um what'd you think i it was a great conversation i mean going into like I didn't really know much of his military background, but going to his military background, his education, and how that all led to him, uh, he is an award-winning filmmaker and yeah. and has won um, kind of a, a pretty coveted award uh, in the film industry. Uh, a lot of people don't know that it's a coveted award because it kind of exists in that nerd space, and we talk about that, but it's it's a pretty big deal. Yeah. Um, so we talk about that. Uh, I love his photography, so I, I brought that up. I wanted to know uh, his experience with that and how he does what he does, and um, just had a real good, real good time. Yeah, I had an awesome time. It was always good catching up with him, and he never, he never has nothing to talk about. So it's, it's always a good <laughs> podcast with that. Um, but uh, other than that, I think we'll just get going with it, right? Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is a long podcast, so buckle in. But it's a good conversation. Um, so I hope you enjoy the show. This is Darren Hafford. Roll it. Welcome to the party. Uh, announced the basketball starting lineups for the university. I would wear a tuxedo and uh, the university actually would pay me to do my Michael Buffer voice. Nice. Ladies no and kidding. gentlemen. And, uh, and so um, because of that, when I saw um, Chancellor Greenhill at the basketball game, I went up and approached him and was like, hey, uh, I was out of the country for almost a year. I was only supposed to be gone for about three months, and it turned into almost a year. And so... Um, Spoke to him that uh, that evening. He said, hey, come stop by the office tomorrow morning at 11. So I went in to um, to talk to him, and his secretary's like, uh, he's he's gone for the day. And I was like, oh, man. Mm. She goes, well, I said, well, I was supposed to have a meeting with him. And she's like, oh, are you Darren Hafford? I said, uh, yeah. And she goes, uh, you have 15 credits. He's already spoken to all of the department heads and everything. <laughs> and he was amazing. And that's how I got back in school in 97. Wow. Then I went. 97 till 99 and uh found out i was going to need another year of school and i was at this point i was ready to be done because i had started in 94 Mm -hmm. then i uh i dropped out in uh uh, 99 moved to lake geneva uh where we got the place with eric (laughs) getch and we made uh coming home a short film uh as the backup to uh, we were going to shoot a, f- a full-length feature about a character, Simon Bain. Uh, oh, my that John God. Do you remember the character's name? Yeah. yeah. Oh, this yeah. was the horror movie you guys were working on. This was on, the right? horror yeah, movie. Yeah. And uh, we had wow. we had gotten this actor, or who we were hoping was going to be an actor, who did not show up at the Subway Sandwich Shop. The owner of the Subway Sandwich Shop opened at like 4 in the morning for us yep. so that wow. we could film and uh true story he uh picked up a stripper from the sugar shack and was like we got a hold of him finally at like 10 in the morning like five hours after he was supposed to be there and he's like uh yeah i I don't think i'm gonna be able to make it today (laughs) right yeah so we uh we went with the uh the smaller project called coming home 
Yeah. Which so, I wish I had a copy of. I don't have a copy of that. That is the I, second I mention of the Sugar Shack on this show. That's I know. I, I heard That's you guys true. discuss it last <laughs> That's week. True. That's uh, true. Yeah. I, I worked hey, at Sugar Shack when I was in college. Is it still Did there? Because I mean, I'm not oh, buying for as a sponsorship. As far as I know, yeah. What was, yeah. The name? what was the manager's name? Dana Fontana? Dana Montana. Dana Montana. Yeah. She, she was <laughs> the first Dana. one that had male strippers. Uh, before um, sugar or before uh, the Chippendales and everything, she was the first one. Uh, she was on Larry King. She wrote a book. Um, really? Oh this yeah, it's, it's a very interesting uh, tale. She's she's quite the character. Yeah, wow. and her son wow. um, uh, was the manager of the place. And I believe he just passed away. Um, but yeah, they were they were great people. Um, that it was uh... an interesting job. That fact of the day was brought to you by Darren Hafford, who was our <laughs> guest. Um, Darren, uh, you've kind of already kind of given a um, an intro as to who you are, but you have a lot more to talk about. Thank you for joining us, Johnny yeah, and the thank Greg. You for the, it's an honor to be here. Thank you. In the middle, I don't know about an honor, but um, <laughs> <laughs> we, are, maybe. We, are, yeah, we, are, we appreciate you being here. Um, can you tell people just real quick kind of what you do right now, and then we'll go back in time and see how you got there? Sure. Uh, so currently I'm in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, I um, came to Texas. I'm a reality camera guy, uh, assistant camera guy, then also do camera work. Reality. And, you're talking about reality TV. Yes, reality oh. television. Mm -hmm. And so what brought me to Texas was a television show called Texas Flip and Move. Um, which did, uh, I think we did 13 seasons of that show on DIY Network, which was the number one show on that network. And so I had been working with um, the owner, Greg Quayle. Uh, I'd done three or four shows uh, with them. Um, started with Restored, uh, which took place in California, and that show, um, I think they're now in their fourth season on HGTV. And um, he would take these old homes and restore them back to what they looked like originally in the 1920s and 30s. So it was a fascinating show. And uh, from that, then I went to Louisiana and filmed the first season and only season, unfortunately, of Louisiana Flip and Move, which was a spinoff of the Texas show. Then I went back to Los Angeles, did Restored Season 2, and then um, came to Texas for Texas Flip and Move. I came in on Season 8 and only came out here for what I thought was going to be uh, three months, and now it's been two and a half years that I've been in Texas. No shit. And so Yeah, so in the last little over three years, I've seen my L.A. apartment for a total of four months when I went back and... <laughs> film that uh, restored season two. So I have a, a subleaser, uh, thankfully, that is taking care of the apartment in Los Angeles. So when it comes to, um, like, are, are you kind of booked or are you like a um, subcontractor? Well, we'll just see how it is next season. Yeah, subcontractor. So right now, uh, what kept me in Texas, because the show wrapped up in uh, May of last year, May, June time frame of last year. And uh, when I got out here, um, a guy that I knew from the Louisiana show, uh, Joey Martinez, um, I ended up staying at his place uh, when I first got here. And through him, I met a guy uh, who owns Meridian Audio and Visual in Dallas. And so I've been doing corporate stuff this whole time, which is much nicer than the reality TV. It pays a lot better. Um, you're in nice five-star hotels filming these CEOs giving these speeches mm -hmm. and things. And so the food's better, uh, the pay's better, the location is better. Um, you're not going through these old condemned homes where there's a dead raccoon laying in the living room. Uh, <laughs> instead, you're, you know, at the, the Ritz, uh, literally. It's a, so, it's a different kind of adventure there, you're saying. Yes, yes. And it's it's been fantastic. And so that's what's kind of kept me uh, in Texas. Um, but because of this virus situation that we're going through, uh, yeah. it's been a, a tough year this year. Um, what are you guys talking about? What virus? What's going on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've heard of it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay. wow. So, yeah. That how, so how's, I hear the virus is, uh, we just got done doing a podcast with, um, Daniela, uh, uh, help Trejo. me out. Trejo. Trejo. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. 
she uh she's a casting uh she tasked she's uh, a rep she's a rep oh okay yeah at a talent agency and she was telling us how this is just slowing down everybody in the business which it's slowing down everybody everywhere production is just shut down i mean right right what what i'm noticing at the most on it i was literally just at my parents and my dad who's uh, uh pushing 70 has absolutely loved the wwe wrestling forever and they're doing it like without a crowd because okay. they they just can't congregate and they're like but we still want to produce a show right. and their stage or the ring at most they've got you know four guys there at a time and they, at least that's what they're keeping it to oh wow but to see that without a crowd and without <laughs> like it is like bad community theater i mean oh, just yeah I bet. Of, the <laughs> pat, pantomime the because they're still doing the drama piece like someone comes out of like their entry and they're still looking around like <laughs> i mean they're still no doing kidding. all that and, and just uh, to watch it is I, I can only take about i can only take about 15 minutes out i'm like i gotta go i gotta go this is just it's surreal uh, that was that was one of my graduation presents uh from my parents was getting to go to see um at the time it was wwf um at the rockford metro center um, oh. <laughs> got to see Hulk Hogan and Ultimate Warrior. Like it was everybody was there. And my two younger brothers were like, dude, this is this is awesome. And I'm like, dude, this is my graduation present, by the way. So <laughs> just so recognize. <laughs> exactly. But um yeah, I was supposed to be in Atlanta uh earlier this month. That got canceled. Then we were supposed to be in Austin, that got canceled. We were supposed to be in Vegas uh next week, that's canceled. So all, all of my gigs through for the corporate thing right now shut down. And we were gonna be working pretty solid until the end of June. And so now I have I have nothing right now. So- and my goal was to take July and August off. And, um, good Lord willing, I'm going to turn 50 in October. Um, so my plan was to, I've been doing a push-up challenge. Uh, a few years ago, I did a push-up challenge for veteran suicide. Right. Where you do 22 push-ups for 22 days. Right. Um, so since I had been in the Marine Corps and the Army, I was doing 44 push-ups for 44 days. So this time around, um, today was day 52. Um, so I've been doing 50 for 50 days. So my goal was to start Saturday, July 4th in Austin, Texas, do 50 push-ups at that state capitol, mm. and then do 50 push-ups at each state capitol within 50 days. So I was going to drive from Austin, Texas oh. to Phoenix. That's the longest oh, that's, drive. That's pretty cool there. Yeah, thanks. And then I was going to, uh, I want to sell t-shirts. I already bought the domain name. I uh, haven't got the website up yet, but it's 50 state capitals in 50 days.com. And so the idea is to raise not only awareness through doing push-ups at each state capital, but also through the T-shirt sales to raise money to, uh, mm-hmm. to help with veteran suicide. Because that actually kills a lot more people than this yeah. coronavirus does. Yeah, mm-hmm. it does. It does. Um, I, you said something back, uh, going back a little bit. You said you were in the Army and the Marines. Yeah, so out of high school, I joined the Marine Corps on my 18th birthday and uh, served four years, two months, and 15 days. Uh, got out of the Marines and then joined uh, the National Guard, the Army National Guard for the state of Wisconsin, um, and did that for six years. I was a military police officer for three of those years, and then my last three years, um, I was a television reporter for the Army. Mm. And then that's mm-hmm. what sent me to Bosnia in 96 and 97. And, and if I recall, you got some kind of accommodation or award or something for, was it, I, and I just remember this from the college class we had together, you had, I think it was an article, uh, so, like a TV program or a yes. movie or something, and an yeah. internet thing all hit on the same day or something? Yeah, so um, when I first got there, our, our television gear wasn't didn't come right away, so we had to wait about a month, and so they were... the. What I did is I volunteered while I was in the broadcasting school at Fort Meade, Maryland, at uh, Dinfos, and um, volunteered for what was supposed to be three months because I had the summer off, and I was like, this is this is a real-world you know, war zone. Um, this mm-hmm. is going to look great on the resume and everything. And so when I volunteered, they did an interstate transfer from the Wisconsin Army National Guard to the Alabama National Guard. 
And so when I got there, um, they're like, you're not going to just sit around and do nothing for a month <laughs> until your camera gear gets here. So we're going to make you do uh, newspaper print uh, uh -huh. articles and stuff. So uh, an article that I had written and a photograph that I had taken uh, got published in the daily newsletter that we had. Um, but uh, by that time, my television stuff had come over. So I had done a video package piece that aired on Armed Forces Network that broadcast over 52 countries, played that night at the chow hall. And so while we were walking in the chow hall, I'm looking at this little newspaper thing going, oh, wow. And then my thing came on the TV and I was like, man, I'm everywhere. And so uh, I, I got recognized for being the first guy to have a photograph published, news article published, and a an, uh, television package air all on the same day. Yeah, that's what it was, yeah. So it's pretty crazy. Yeah, it is pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. I've, had, I've had an interesting uh, life. <laughs> yeah, I'm for still sure. Still working you on have. the uh, documentary and the book. <laughs> but, well, uh, going back to your 50 states, link all that to us, get us that so sure, we can help sure. promote that because that's absolutely. I'm all about that. Um, yeah. My, yeah, my dad, my dad's a former Marine, so I, I support that as much as I can when I can. Um, Outstanding. Yeah. Good, good to use former Marine as well because oh, the yeah, Marine is a guy that's been kicked out. Yep. Uh, it's always I've, a former I've Marine. I've made a couple mistakes along the way. <laughs> so he'll I. correct you. <laughs> so have I. Yep. I have a uh, friend, uh, shout out to Michael Brady. He, uh, I said, uh, you're an ex-Marine. He goes, whoa. whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it, it, he's, he put a little, I was a little scared when he said, I was like, oh, what happened? What was going on? He's like, you're never an ex-Marine. Correct. So, yeah. Correct. I was like, whoa, I stand corrected. Yeah, right. and my... a little over a year, uh, and back in August of 2018, I went to a Marine Corps reunion in Yorktown, Virginia, um, and that was my first duty station. I guarded uh, special weapons, and then from there, I went to an anti-terrorist unit uh, as my last year and a half, FAST Company, it was called, Fleet Anti-Terrorist Security Team, and so uh, it was interesting because the, when I was in Fast Company, there were two uh, Fast Companies. There was an East Coast Fast and a West Coast Fast. And I was in West Coast Fast, which was at Mare Island Naval Shipyard, Vallejo, California, uh, about a half an hour from San Francisco. Uh, in, in 93, they shut that base down. I got out December 18th, 1992, and then they consolidated Fast Company, which originally was in Norfolk, which was 30 minutes from Yorktown, where my first duty station was. So now Fast Company is at Yorktown. So it was interesting because I was like uh, going to both of my old units, which now were at the same place, yeah. which was bizarre because I don't think they do the uh, security forces as far as the weapons uh, situation at Yorktown anymore, but Fast is there. So, Wow, so you were anti-terrorism? Yeah, yeah, it was uh, very I never, intense. I never knew that. Yeah, what <laughs> I, I would imagine it's intense. Yeah. Um, the job was to go back and take back hostages. So we constantly trained. Um, they were on the flight deck to go into Benghazi, but were not actually sent in. Hmm. So, yeah, wow. we constantly trained. Um, it sounded really cool when... when uh, myself and two other guys, uh, Jeff Kim and Brian Ketter, we all three were like, hey, let's, we, we want to go to FAST, you know? And so we put in our request, and the uh, staff sergeant in admin was like, you're, you're wasting your time. You're not going from B-billet to B-billet. You're going to have to go to the fleet and be a real Marine. And we all three got it. And so when the orders <laughs> came in and we are like... Well, I'm glad we didn't listen to you, you know. Kind of thing. <laughs> and so Ketter got there a month. Ketter and Kim both left a month before I did. And then when I arrived, Ketter was already there. And he was he was waiting for me when I got out in the field where they were training. And I was like, how, so how is it? He's like, dude, this was a huge mistake, man. All we do is run uh, and everything. And so my first day, uh, like, training with them, uh, everything was much different and fast than it was the regular Marine Corps. So we ran the obstacle course twice, then uh, ran four miles, then ran the obstacle course again. Wow. And um, then when, when, we, when we went to the pistol range, I was used to just shooting and uh, on a straight line and not moving. And they all started advancing, like up to the target. Oh, okay. So you walk closer to your target so it's easier to shoot them. 
and they start, you know, they yell ceasefire and they start screaming and yelling at me and what the hell are you doing, Hafford? And I'm like, what are you guys doing? Like, <laughs> but why are you guys all walking? You know, and, and uh, they're like, this is fast company. We do shit different here. And oh, yeah, they did. So it was wow. very, very intense. Um, that sounds like some... a movie just in itself. Yeah, no kidding. We never got called, though. You know, like oh, okay. we never got to go and actually do it. So it, uh, while the training was awesome, I, I became pretty good with the pistol and um but it was just yeah it was a lot of running and a that, lot of a lot of high speed training mm-hmm. uh, now that i think about it i think they did make a movie like that with uh jake gyllenhaal he was in the middle east oh, yeah jarhead. that was jarhead jarhead yeah, oh yeah that that's what place, it was yeah that took place while i was in the marine corps uh that that's okay. about the um desert storm and yeah. so i remember sitting in the movie theater and uh, at times, laughing my ass off, uh, and people were like horrified. Because, <laughs> laughing why? Um, laughing why? Because it took me back to sure. that t- the language. Um, so just it was pretty all- accurate. It was very accurate. That yeah. that movie and uh, Full Metal Jacket are probably the two best uh, representations of the Marine Corps, at okay. least at the time I was in, from eighty eight to ninety two. Yeah. Full Metal and, Jacket. Um, oh, dude. So two weeks before I ship out. My uh, stepdad, um, former Marine, brings home Full Metal Jacket, and we're watching it on the VCR, and I hear him laughing behind Mm -hmm. me, you know, at these horrible things during the the first part of the movies, them in basic training. And and I turn back, and I look at him, and I'm like, why are you laughing? Like, this is is terrifying. He goes, (laughs) because you think you got it bad with your mom. And you got no idea where you're going. <laughs> and I was thankful after I got there that he had done that because it at least better prepared me if you could get better prepared for what was coming. If I'd have just showed up like without having seen that movie two weeks before, I, I would have been a mess. So wait, wait, take me there because I've always been really super interested in uh, boot camp. Like oh. your your first day. Yeah. Your first day. So walk me through. Literally, you put your two feet on the ground and you're ready to go. Like, what happens? Well, so um, I reported to Milwaukee MEPS and then they flew me to San Diego. And they're like, okay, when you get off the plane, just look for the Marine. Uh, he'll be in uniform. So just go up and approach him. Yeah. And uh, and he'll take you to where you need to go. And so I, I'm all excited. This it really hadn't been on too many plane flights at this point. And so I'm, you know, walking through the airport. I see him and I walk up and, and he's like, follow me, keep your eyes to yourself and, uh, keep your mouth shut. And so keep your eyes to yourself. What does that even mean? So just don't be like looking around, you know, like enjoying the (laughs) view. Eyes to yourself. Just bobble headed. follow, (laughs) Follow me. So he takes me outside and there's this school bus that everybody's already sitting on. And, um, he's like, all right, uh, put your left hand on your left knee, your right hand on your right knee, look straight ahead to the back of the skull in front of you. Don't move. Don't say a word. I'll be back. And then we just sat there until he brought the other, uh, recruits. Cause in the so Marine Corps, hear- hang on, so, hang on. So when you, when you're hearing all that right away, like keep your eyes focused, like, you know, all that jazz, what are you thinking right there? Are you like, holy shit? <laughs> yeah. Oh Yeah. And, and he's like, you know, this is your last chance, by the way, if you want to make a break for it kind of thing. And I was <laughs> like, uh, all right. God. And so get on the bus, sitting there waiting. He brings some other guys in. And then finally, uh, we drive um, to the base, San Diego MCRD, Marine Corps mm-hmm. Recruit Depot. Now, the Marine Corps is different than the Army. The Army, they usually call the, the guys um, in basic uh, private. You don't get called that in the Marine Corps because private is the first rank in the Marine Corps and you're not entitled to be even called anything other than whale shit because whale shit is the lowest thing (laughs) on the earth because it falls down to the ocean floor. So so, uh, you're a recruit and um, so we get there, the bus pulls in and it's just like the movie. He comes on the bus, he's like, you got two seconds to get on the yellow footprints and they have already painted 
yellow footprints on the ground where you're supposed to stand and how you're even supposed to have your feet at a 45 degree angle. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so we, you know, we get out in the footprints and everything and I'll never forget this. This guy's got a t-shirt with all of his high school graduating class on the back of it. Oh no. Yeah. And, uh, (laughs) I don't know if I should say that. Uh, You should say this. Go for it. Cause it's, it, it, it's at a time when, um, uh, political correctness did not exist. No, not at all. In 1988. I'm sure it probably existed, sort of, but it wasn't the catchphrase. Not right. the Marine Corps. Very slow at adapting uh, to anything. So, guys wearing the t-shirt and the drill instructor, and, and I thought this was our drill instructor. These guys were actually only our training drill instructors for the first week while we were getting processed in, our shots and everything, and then they marched us over to our real drill instructors, and then that's oh. when the training began. Um, even though you've already had your head shaved, because they get you, that's the first thing. You get on those yellow footprints, then you get the haircut, and then um, we spent that at night on our hands and knees with a six inch uh, laundry brush sweeping the floor. And we did that like four times. And I was like, why, man, why are we sweeping? And it was to tell you that um, no matter how many times you did something, you know, attention to detail, you're going to miss mm-hmm. something, you know. And I remember like after the second time thinking, this floor is clean. Like we just swept this floor. <laughs> right. Why are we doing this again? And then we did it two more times. And each time we found, still found some dirt. Like it was mm. crazy. Well, anyway, a guy's wearing the t-shirt and he comes up to him and he's like, uh, first girl's name. I don't know. It was like Amy Adams or something like that, you know, because they're in alphabetical order. Mm. You fucker. <laughs> sir, sir, no, sir. And immediately you're, t- you know, told you the first thing out of your mouth is sir. And the last thing out of your mouth is sir. And it's not your mouth, it's a, your sewer trap. And um, he's like, sir, no, sir. So then he goes to the next girl's name. And he's like, uh, did you fuck her? Sir, no, sir. And he goes to the oh, third boy. girl. Sir, no, sir. He goes, what are you, a fucking faggot? What, you suck dick? This isn't the fucking Navy. You're in the fucking Marine Corps. And I'm just like, oh, man. Oh, wow. I mean, and I didn't wear, like, I just wore a plain T-shirt. So oh. it's like, they were looking for anything anything, in anything yeah to you apart and just ruin your life basically. what was yours where they get you on um not much at first i was actually uh they had asked if anybody had done rotc in high school and so because i had done four years of rotc that actually got me promoted uh when i went in the marine mm-hmm. corps so i was never an e1 i started off as an e2 right out of basic training and because of that um I eventually made corporal in my four years, and a lot of guys that I knew did not. Um, and what allowed me that was the time in grade and time in service at that rank, because um, it's all based on a point system. And I had also maxed out on my education points. So did you, you know, could, Darren, that you were going to do this from like right from high school? You knew this is the direction you wanted to go? Yeah, because I didn't have the grades in high school. I didn't take high school seriously. I just I was the smallest kid in high school. So when I graduated and went in the Marine Corps, I was only 5'4", 120. So I was actually two pounds too small to be in the Marines. So they made me a double rats uh, recruit. And what that meant was I had to eat twice as much food as everyone else. Oh. So um, from the time I went to basic training on October 3rd and graduated on December 23rd, two days before Christmas, and let me tell you, you want to make sure – like that, that was the biggest fear was getting recycled because you knew if you missed anything, you were going to be there through Christmas and New Year's. So uh, it was like, I don't want to do that. And mm-hmm. so in that two and a half, almost three months, I grew three inches in height. Halfway oh, through wow. basic training, I had to get new be- boots because my feet had grown so much. And so when I, my mom met me at the Holiday Inn in South Beloit, to pick me up from the, the Van Galder bus system, um, she walked right past me. And I, was I, like, I, I oh, turned wow. and I was like, you don't even recognize your firstborn son? And she's like, oh my God, they stretched you. And so in the Marine Corps, I grew seven inches uh, after high school. And you have the Corps to thank for that, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. 
So when I went to my my high school reunion, I won most change since high school because no one knew who sure. I was. One, oh, I had yeah. a date, which and nobody dates the guy that's smaller than the wrestling. <laughs> okay. So, Where did yeah. you go to high school? Beloit Memorial. Oh no, kidding! Yeah, I'm no. a full night. I I grew up in Broadhead, which is oh okay, yeah, yeah not my, that far I, away from there. We live. My dad lives in Norfordville now. Oh, sure. And we live, uh, my mom and my stepdad, they have a ranch uh, out on St. Lawrence, close to, to Broadhead. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Is that the same place, Darren, that I went to with uh, that, that dog, Jet, that your dad fell in love with? Is that the same uh, house? Yeah, it should be. Yeah. They, okay. they were there. Right. They bought that house while I was in the Marines. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. And so they're still out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. It's fantastic. Wow. 75 acres. Oh, wow. Ponds. It's fun to go home because we get to shoot in the backyard. And yeah, it's it's a good time. Okay, so after the Marine Corps or during the Marine Corps, did you kind of just fall into this whole camera movie making, or has that always been something that you've always loved? Always loved it. Uh, the first movie I saw in the movie theater uh, is right over Greg's shoulder. There, <laughs> Superman was yep. the first movie I ever saw. Oh, okay. And um. Uh, my mom met, uh, my stepdad, Ron, uh, while I was in high school. But, uh, before that, um, uh, we weren't the richest family. And so, um, a lot of kids went and saw star Wars yeah. and, uh, cause they came out around the same time. 77, I think. 78. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, for me, uh, the only movie I'd ever been to or seen was Superman. So I was like, you know, screw star Wars. Uh, I'm, I'm all about Superman. Yeah. And when I was sitting in that movie theater, I was like, that's what I want to, I want to do that. I want to make movies. Oh, the like the beginning Superman, got you right away then, right? Oh, the, man. Da, because da, 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 well, you, had, you had Ned Beatty, you had Gene <laughs> Hatton, you yeah. had Marlon Brando, what you had that? the greatest Superman of all time, Christopher Reeve. Like, I won't even watch another Superman. I haven't seen any other Superman since Superman 4, unfortunately. Really? Because... It's not Christopher Reeve. Like to me, no one was a better Superman than Christopher Reeve. Like, uh, nobody. He, so he, he was he's your Christopher. he's your James Bond. He's like oh, you know absolutely. my mom always loved Sean Connery, so there's always yeah. somebody's James Bond. But that's your guy, Christopher Reeve. Right. And so um, when I started going to Whitewater, um, I was uh, an MP in the National Guard. So my plan was to go to Whitewater for a semester transfer to Platteville because Platteville had a great uh, police science program. Yep, my brother went there. And uh, I was hoping to be a police officer from my hometown, Boyd, Wisconsin. Well, while I was at Whitewater, they had postings uh, throughout, you know, for radio and for TV mm-hmm. stuff. And so I, I had always kind of wanted to do that. And um, I decided to stay at Whitewater instead and kind of go that route. And then um, fast forward, I'm in the military police for three years. I get demoted uh, because <laughs> I went to see the Eagles concert uh, at Alpine Valley instead of going to army training for a weekend. I mean, it was the Hell Freezes Over tour. So like, well, they were, they were, they were never going to come back together. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so my buddy Mike Celette from high school calls me up. He's like, dude, I got an extra ticket for the Eagles. You want to go? And I'm like, yeah, but I got Army stuff. He's like, oh, well, what are you going to do? I'm like, yeah, well, I've already got an honorable discharge from the Marine Corps. I don't really <laughs> got to tell anybody about this Army stuff. Let's go to God. <laughs> so I get demoted, and I didn't like being a, a cop, actually, because um, a lot of them are not cool. I mean, they're some they're, there's some jerk cops out there so uh, would wait, you say what? it was more it was <laughs> would you say it was more the the people you worked with or yes. the job itself mostly the people i worked with there were there were some guys i liked but uh like brian douglas who also was a former marine who came in the in the army as well um but other than that i i i didn't really like the army guys i mean after having been in an anti terrorist unit you know, and then going to one weekend a month and it's like, mm-hmm. you guys are wannabes. Like you, if you really wanted to do this, you would have done this full time and not like as your part time gig. And so I get demoted and now I'm like, really like, fuck the army. Like I'm done with <laughs> this, you know, 
And I'm in the armory bullshitting with a couple of other soldiers and a guy named Sam White uh, from Madison. Uh, he's walking by and he stops and he goes, you know, you got a good broadcasting voice. I'm like, oh, thanks. Okay. And he goes, uh, you, you, you ever thought about being a TV reporter for the Army? And I'm like, what? The Army <laughs> has TV reporters? He's like, yeah. So... Um, we talk a little bit. He gets my number. Uh, he sets up an interview. I end up going in and meeting Major Mike Gorley, um, who was the commander of the uh, Public Affairs Unit in Madison. And uh, sit down. He's got my service record book. He's looking through it. You know, he sees all the Marine Corps stuff, and that looks great. You know, he, and then he then he gets to the demotion, and he's like, uh, kind of confused look comes on his face, and I know what's coming. <laughs> And uh, he goes, uh, what, what's this? I'm like, well, you like the Eagles? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I proceed to tell him. He's, he shakes his head. And um, so he goes, uh, well, if you can you know, stay out of trouble for a little bit, uh, we'll, we'll consider you. And so I did. I went in. They had me um, record my uh, voiceover audition tape. And then they sent that to the the broadcast school and then um this was in 95 and so um my first year of college i was a i joined lambda chi i started uh whitewater in january of 94 most people start in the fall i started in the spring right, yeah. which was very bizarre and so um i partied uh way too much to the where no. the university was like yeah, whitewater yeah, yeah, really? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and uh, they were like, maybe you take some time off and uh, reevaluate. Reevaluate, what you're doing. yeah. So I ended up working at Ketter Hagen Ford uh, as an oil changing guy that fall semester of '95, and obviously was miserable. Um, I, I worked there that summer and then through the fall. And then uh, went to broadcasting school for the Army in the spring of 96. And uh, while I was there, that's when I volunteered to go. So it was crazy. Wow. So you go to mm -hmm. Bosnia, and you are basically a reporter. Mm -hmm. So I was stationed. Zone. Yeah, so I was stationed in Hungary, and then we would travel down to Bosnia to do the stories. Sometimes, a lot of stories we also did in the local area in Hungary. In Kaposvar, Kaposhulak, um, Tazar Airfield was where I was uh, based at. And then we would go down and, and do stories. And at that point, the war was, you know, the, the conflict was over. Um, but there were still little things here and there that happened. And so I remember one time we drove down. I ended up shooting a bunch of footage uh, of the different base camps. So they sent that to the general so they could decide which base camps they were going to keep open, which ones they were going to close down. And we drove through this one uh, town and the, the snow on the ground and <clears throat> some of the buildings look like they had like literally just been blown up. And um, so when I get there, usually the first thing I would do is find the highest uh, structure that I could go to, to get an aerial view of mm -hmm. the surrounding base camp. And so I'm talking to the tower guard and I'm like, Man, it looks like they just blew stuff up. He goes, oh, yeah, about five hours before you guys drove through that neighborhood, they, they blew up like nine homes. And I'm like, no one told me that before we were driving <laughs> wow. through kind of thing. And so, um, yeah, it was, it was very uh, eye-opening. And then um, I come home, uh, and my unit ends up to get to go de get deployed because I had volunteered, so I was with Alabama. Um, then – my unit from Madison gets activated and I wanted to go with them, you know, cause I was like, this is great money, you know, mm -hmm. in college, anything is pretty good money. Excuse me. Yeah. And so, uh, but unfortunately president Clinton made it where you couldn't deploy more than once. And so my Wisconsin unit got based in Germany and spent their whole rotation in Germany and when they got back, my sergeant, he's like, man, you missed out, dude. We were, we were working in Germany, you know, during the week. And then on the weekends, we were skiing in the Swiss Alps and we were doing this. And I'm like, dude, I, yeah. I hate you. I hate yeah. you. 
And so then uh, I was back in Whitewater. Then on a Tuesday in the spring of 99, I got a phone call um, from my commander. And he's like, you ever been to Honduras? I'm like, no. And uh, you want to go? I'm like, Okay. And so Saturday I was in Honduras. Uh, wow. They flew me down for two weeks to cover the uh, rebuilding effort of Hurricane Mitch, which just, just devastated the country. Mm-hmm. And so to see what man can do to the environment, because um, I'd fly in helicopters and shoot aerial footage, um, and it was pockets of devastation, you yeah. know, house here, house there, you know, small villages and stuff. But then to go over in Honduras, everything was just destroyed, Mm -hmm. completely destroyed. And that had probably a bigger effect on me. Uh, One, because I didn't have the the buildup to psychologically prepare, you know, when you're getting ready to deploy, you know, it takes a couple of months. It it was days. And Mm -hmm. then I was back at Whitewater. So it was like, wow, boom, I'm there. Boom, I'm back. And I can remember just sitting there and, and. Just like, wow, we are so blessed here in the United States. Oh, yeah, without question. Um, even right now, you're, you're kind of getting this idea of how spoiled and soft we really are as a oh, country, yeah. just in terms of um, people deal with this type of um, whatever we're going to go through economy-wise in the next coming months, people deal with this all the time. This yeah. is, I mean, the reasons are different, but... You know, for those of us that are sitting there, the fact that we even have the ability to hoard toilet paper is mm-hmm. a blessing in disguise. Um, Absolutely. But- the, the thing I remember the most <clears throat> about that two weeks was, so we were out in the jungle um, in tents in Honduras. And um, there was a, a small family that had a, a house by the front gate, if you will, which was basically just bob wire like you know um and there was a family there and they were you know trying to sell cigar handmade cigars and stuff and and a few other things and uh, it was two kids a little boy and a little girl about eight nine years old and before the hurricane you had to have shoes to go to school like if you went to school you had to be wearing shoes after the hurricane you had to have a piece of paper and a pencil that's all you needed to do to go to school. And if you didn't have that, they, they didn't want you in the classroom. So um, I'm with the translator because I don't speak Spanish. And uh, I, I took two notepads, two, you know, like regular little legal mm. notepads, not even a legal notepad, just a smaller notepad. And I think a box of pencils. And so I take the translator over there. I'm like, hey, I want to give this to this little, these, these two kids. Yeah. And... Um, so they they're stunned so she runs back into the house and the dad comes out and he's crying Hmm. he's crying and uh, you know and he's hugging me and you know and and talking and the translator's telling me what he's saying and and i'm just like dude this is three dollars at walmart like yeah yeah right you know but for them it meant you know that pad of paper would take her to school mm. for as long as that pad of paper would last. Wow. You know, and that's where I learned, uh, how horrible human beings can be to each other because, mm-hmm. uh, all of these things were donated by the, U, uh, American people. And we would go into these little villages and we would, you know, give them to the local superintendent, if you will, or principal of the school. And we're doing this, and this Honduran soldier just starts screaming at this lady. And he's yelling, and and we're all like, what the heck's going on? So ask the translator, hey, what's what's the story here? And uh, so we get the story, and it turns out that they are taking the supplies that they're getting for free, putting them in a closet, and then selling them to the people in their own village instead of giving the stuff to the kids. So his, so we, we asked the soldier, like, what do you think we should do here? And he's like, give it directly to the kids. Don't give it to the mm-hmm. adults. Yeah. Right. Cause that lady is corrupt as hell. And she's selling this stuff that she's getting for free mm-hmm. to her own people. Wow. And so at that point we started directly handing out the supplies to the kids 
Damn. just so that we could, bear, you know, make sure that they got what mm-hmm. they were supposed to have. Yeah. And I was like, man, like, you know, you, you, this country just lost about eight to 10,000 people that were washed out to sea because of the flooding, mm-hmm. because of the overforestation of the mountainside. The trees were no longer there to hold the mud in, right. the dirt. So when the, the floods came, it just washed it all out. And so those people just washed out to see, never seen again. Oh my God. And so that was, yeah, that was very, very devastating. <clears throat> wow. And so that's when you're like, the, the hoarding the toilet paper and everything, it's like, yeah, not really a surprise, you know, yeah. in right. these times. Yeah. So anyway, uh, sorry. No, sorry, no, 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 no. It's, um, <laughs> The what I like about these podcasts is I didn't know this stuff about you. You never carry yourself like this when I've right. known you for all the years that I've known you. You mm-hmm. you don't you don't ever talk about this. Not that I've ever poked and prodded. I just you don't carry yourself like you're a, like you were an anti terrorism unit. Like that's not that's not the Darren I know. Oh, get me on a pistol range. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure, I'm sure. Um, I kind of want to transition to kind of the sure. the um. Now, okay, so I just want to transition to you now. You're in LA, and and I'm looking at your IMDb, and you have you have all these things, but I want to bring up one, um, okay. and I think I don't know. You can tell me where this is. It's your director credit for Forever Solo or Solo Forever. Oh, Solo Forever, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Uh, Greg will get a kick out of this. Greg, have you ever heard of this short? Uh, only when you sent me his resume. <laughs> okay. okay. So solo forever, according to IMDb, the plot is a man in the middle of a relationship break, uh, relationship breakdown must destroy his star war figures to save his love life. Yes. Yeah. Now, no. now yeah. tell the story of this. Cause I think Greg will geek out here. So oh, I want to hear this. So uh, the tagline is exactly what Johnny said. A uh, guy has to decide between his action figures and his new girlfriend, and not everybody makes it out alive. And um, <laughs> so I met Trey Albright, who actually is from Dallas. Uh, funny, funny guy. Very talented actor, very talented writer. And so he had written this script. And um, his girlfriend was friends with my girlfriend at the time. And... She was like, you know, do you think you can kind of help him out with this? And I was like, okay, sure. Now, I had only seen Star Wars once. Still have only seen Star Wars once. And The first one or all of them? uh, I haven't even seen like the last three, maybe. Yeah. Um, You're speaking speaking English, but I don't think I quite understand. (laughs) You're going to get really pissed here. (laughs) What what you're talking about. And so, again, Superman is the shit. Uh, that was the yep. first movie I ever saw. So, again, fast forward, um, Star Wars grew Star Wars. So, um, the first time I ever saw Star Wars was while I was in broadcasting school for the Army on a VHS tape in uh, uh, Army barracks at Fort Meade, Maryland. <laughs> and uh, I'm 26 years old at this point, okay? So... Star Wars, if you see it when you're seven or eight, you know, it's going to be the greatest thing ever. Uh, However, I did not. And so I was, you know, and I'm I'm, I'm already aware of the hype, clearly, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, because it had been out for almost 20 years at this point. And so I'm just like, this, what's the big deal here? Like, really, (laughs) this is not that impressive to me. Uh, Superman is still the shit. And so, um, so Trey had written this this short film, Solo Forever, and um, and I I read it, you know, and I'm like, okay, you know, whatever. I I don't get, I didn't get a lot of the jokes or anything. Like sure. I didn't know who this Greedo dude was, and um, who shot first, and all of these yeah. things, you know, and uh, and and then I find out that there's a whole conspiracy that Lucas like changed the movie, you know, because. He didn't want Han Solo to look so mean, I guess. I don't know. But <clears throat> so, so we, uh, I borrow a camera. Uh, we borrow a Canon 5D. We have one lens. It's a 50 mil lens. So mm-hmm. it's, I can't, I move the camera. There's no mm-hmm. <laughs> zooming in or zooming out. It's a fixed focal lens. And they say the nifty 50. And so, <clears throat> 
uh, Trey's girlfriend, Elise, uh, knows a guy, and we end up filming behind Rick James's old mansion. Um, which I don't know if you, I, I didn't know the story of how much of a super freak Rick James was, oh, but he spent yes. time in prison. Him and his girl kidnapped another woman and had her chained in their house. Yep. That's a Wednesday night. So yeah. that was, yeah. <laughs> so like this guy's giving us the tour and he's, and he's completely remodeling the place. So he's living in the guest house while the main house is being remodeled. And he's like showing us, yeah, this is where the room was where they had her chained up. And then there was a door in a hallway that went to another door in a hallway, no windows. And then another hallway. So if she got out, she wasn't getting out. And he was like, <laughs> what God. the hell? So, so anyway, we shoot in, uh, off of the property. There's a hiking trail and everything, and that's where we get the, the natural green foliage and everything. And so we shoot a bunch of the scene, most of it there. We shoot one scene uh, at his apartment, and then we went out to Santa Monica, and we shot a beach scene. And I end up editing it in my bedroom in my uh, L.A. apartment. Um, and that's it, you know. Uh, he comes in, he lays some audio tracks down. Uh, he, I remember he, we used a paper towel roller, the, the cardboard roll oh, uh, so that he could do one of the voices. Uh, I think it was Darth Vader's voice. And so, um, we, <laughs> we do this whole thing together and you think it's Vader. It, yeah, it was Vader. It was Maybe. Vader. Yeah. Calm down. And so, right, calm down. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it is it, like I wish we would have documented this better because the story is just freaking crazy. And so um, we need a Greedo. OK, so we end up driving an hour t to spend ten dollars on this Greedo action figure. Uh, and it's like legit, dude. The dude lives in his parents' basement. He's got three different Greedos that we can look at, you know, to determine which one we want to buy. Um, and I'm just like, nerd, super nerd. Like, <laughs> what the, what are we doing here, man? And um, we buy the Greedo, and it has this, like, felt, uh, he's got, like, a, a jacket on, right? Uh -huh. Felt material. Yep. And uh, so when we're shooting, um, I'm like, dude, I can't see the gun on Greedo's side. So, like, we we cut the, the and, and that was <gasps> a, a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because um, I had a couple of friends uh, that helped out, John Hoadley, uh, Jason, Chris, um, Will. Um, these guys, they're, they're reading the script while, we're, you know, while I'm setting up shots and stuff, and they're just dying at some of the jokes, of which I, again, right over my head, right over my head. So, um, matter of fact, we had uh, uh, Klinger, Jason Klinger, um, climb up in a tree and shoot one of the shots because he was the, the smallest guy that we could lift up to get the camera up into this tree to shoot this one particular shot. And so anyway, we shoot that day and we edit it, we get it done and Trey submits it. And I'm just like, well, that was that, you know, I've done a bunch of short films, you know, you never... submit it to, uh, it was submitted for the star Wars fan film contest. Okay. Yep. So, um, <laughs> Fast forward, Trey gives me a call, and he's like, dude, we're top 20 finalists in this thing, and we just got VIP tickets to go to Comic-Con down in San Diego mm -hmm. as VIPs. And I'm like, okay, what's Comic-Con? And he's like, because I'm not a comic <laughs> book dude. And he's like, dude, this is the biggest, coolest what? thing there is, man. Like, how it's, have you not heard of Comic-Con? It's nerd dude. mecca. Yeah. Go on the first day of Comic Con. Don't go on the third. Those costumes, uh, they don't wash them, and it get gets little, funky little right. by day yeah, three. <laughs> so um, he's in contact with them, and at this point, the first version that we sent uh, had no dialogue from the action figures. So it, so this guy is talking to his action figures, and then there's nothing back which I actually preferred because I mm. thought that was even funnier because then I felt that the audience was going to put their own little dialogue in. But Trey was right uh, on the whole project. Um, he was like, you know, dude, we got we to do the voices. Got to do the voices. And so he lets them know, hey, 
uh, I'm glad you liked the version that you have, but mm -hmm. we finished it. That was, you know, our first draft. If you'd like to see the second draft, um, we can send it to you. And they were like, yeah, yeah, we'd love, we'd love to see it. So he sends it off. And then um, I'm driving him to uh, drop off the second version. And at this point, he's working as a barista at a coffee shop. I get a flat tire on Wilshire Boulevard uh, after we had dropped it off. And you're like, we're, we're so excited at this point because we're like, dude, like this is a, kind of a big deal, you know, mm -hmm. we're, you know. And um, he ends up getting fired because he's late to work because of the flat tire. Um, and we're just, I'm just like, man, this thing is jinxed. Like, this is going nowhere, you know, whatever. So we end up driving down to San Diego. Now, we're so broke that we, um, one, we didn't have a hotel room or anything. And um, we pitched a tent in the parking garage for a couple of hours until they told us we couldn't do that. Yeah. And so we ended up sleeping in the car for the three days, I think it was, that we were down there. Ooh. So we get down there, and dude, there's this enormous line, just this huge line of people dressed in costumes of all kinds of different, mm -hmm. like any comic book, any anything, you know? And then you're just like, what the heck is going on, you know? And we get there. And we go up to the security lady, and we're like, yes, we're trying to get into the line. And she's like, you see the line over there? That's where you got to go. And so Trey, Trey and I start walking, and he's like, no, dude, man. He's like, we're VIP, bro. Like, we're not we're not the regular guys. We're VIP, man. Not any of these normies. And uh, so we turn around and start walking back to the lady. And uh, she's like, yeah, right over there. That's the line. And he's like, but... But our tickets say VIP. And she's like, oh, I, oh, I'm so sorry. No, no, no. Right this way, gentlemen. And walks us in the door. There's no line. Like, we're like, <laughs> I'm like, holy shit. We're getting the lanyards, we're putting it on. You know, we got, I'm like, man, this is the way to do this. This is all right, you know. So then we uh, meet up with the lady uh, who it turns out she's George Lucas's right hand person. Mm -hmm. And Kevin? what's that? Was it Kathleen Kennedy? Uh, I don't remember the name. She was, uh, there were two women that we met at the time. One was a short blonde haired woman. Um, I've got pictures of them, but uh, I don't remember her name. I just remember like peppering her with questions. Sure. Just like, you know, like, how did you guys narrow this down? Like, um, and she's like, I can't answer any of your questions right now. Uh, you know, because tonight we'll do the announcement of who mm. wins. And um, we come back later that night. Now, um, where they're doing the presentation of the trophies uh, is in the same hall as True Blood was at that time. So it's a yep. massive hall of people. It's, I believe it was Hall H. Uh, that's probably correct because I, I took pictures. Like, it's it, it was insane. Massive, I, and I just remember massive. thinking, like, we should steal the, the sign so that it says Star Wars fan film thing, just in case we win, you know? And uh, we didn't get it. But um, so we go to the thing, and we sit down in the VIP area. We're right up front. And, and Trey is for sure. He's, I, I've never met somebody so confident that, yeah, we won this, man. We're getting a trophy out of this. And there's only wow. eight trophies. Uh, there's different categories. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we sit down, and we're talking to the other you know, filmmakers and everything, and we're pretty nerded out and excited. And, and I remember, and they're like, so the, the two guys in front of us, uh, they're like, so is this your first time? And I'm like, yeah, it's obviously our first time, you know. And he's like, well, um, this is my fifth time being a finalist, and uh, we've never won. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> man, dude. And then the guys behind us go, well, this is our seventh time that we've been here and never won. And then, you know, they turn around and the guys behind us, you know, confer. And I, I lean into Trey and I'm like, dude, we are in the loser section. Like, we're not <laughs> winning here. All right. And so the thing starts. And um, trophy number five is ours. We end up winning for best comedy. And the guys that are presenting us the trophy are... Um, uh, Seth Green and the guys from Robot Chicken. 
oh, are up nice. on stage. Those are great guys. I've met them. They are very nice. One of them's actually a Packer fan, too, yep. I found out. And so um, as they announce uh, the word solo, the S starts to come out, and Trey has launched out of the seat and is running up to the stage. And he's looking around trying to find, like, because they have this, you know, nice little uh, decorative, like, I don't know, um, curtain kind of thing. And he hurdles over the top of that. You know, and I'm just like, holy shit, he's already halfway up the stage before I even get to stand up, you know, because wow. it's like, so, and he's like, gone. So um, I get up there, you know, and and all of a sudden, you know, I'm looking out in this huge crowd of people and um, they give us the trophy or uh, uh, Trey has a speech written. All right. So he's he's ready. And he's just like, you know, this thing wouldn't have happened if it wouldn't for my buddy Darren. You know, he shot it. He edited it. He picked the music for it. He did the color correcting. He did everything. Like, I'm so thankful for this guy. Like, here he is, you know. And I walk up to the podium and I see all of these people. (laughs) And I blank. Like, I blank so bad that I don't even say thank you or anything. I just (laughs) wave. (laughs) <laughs> and turn and as i'm turning i see seth green looking at me with this look on his face like what the fuck's he doing and i'm like oh shit and then i just and i'm wearing cargo shorts and a red wisconsin t-shirt touristy looking as hell and then yeah. so i get off stage and i'm holding the trophy and i'm thinking and i see seth and i'm like oh my god i would love to get a picture with this guy you know like austin powers and he comes over and he's like, hey, uh, do you mind if we uh, all get a picture with the trophy together? I'm like, uh, yeah, absolutely. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> so we get the pictures with him and everything. And um, then we go back the next day. So I get to ask all the questions that I was. And I had obviously more questions. And I, I was like, so how, how did this all, you know, she goes, well, we wa- we have a team of people that watch all the shorts that are submitted, you know, and then we narrow them into the different categories that, the, that we think they should be in. And then we narrow it down and we narrow it down and we narrow it down because we get, you know, a couple thousand different submissions mm-hmm. and stuff. And I'm like, whoa, I didn't realize this thing was that big, you know, it's and it's huge. It's yeah. It's huge. Yeah. I find out that night how big it is. Morgan yeah. Spurlock, the dude from Super Size yeah. Me, yeah. comes up to me now. And I believe he won an Oscar for he, Super Size Me. He, so yeah, he comes up to me and he's like, dude, I just need a picture with the trophy. I'm like, yeah, absolutely, man. And he's like, uh, you realize this is more rare than the Oscar. They give out tons of Oscars every year. They only give out eight of these trophies a year. And I'm like, dude, I will gladly trade you <laughs> this C-3PO and R2-D2 statue because the the trophy itself is c-3po holding a bucket of popcorn and r2d2 holding a soda and the guy that yeah, designed the guys, trophies if anybody the wants to uh, anybody check wants it out on funny or die yeah, it's on his well it's also on your um it's also on your facebook isn't it 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 may be i'm not sure if the finished one is uh the finished one for sure is on funny or die and it's just solo forever Again, Derek, is that send, where it is? send us that link. Right. I will. I will okay. link it down below. I was trying yeah. to find. I was trying to find the movie. Is that okay? Yeah, that funny or that? die, solo die? forever. Yeah. Okay. Um, the the big thing that blew my mind though was when I was asking her all of the questions. She's like, "So we have it narrowed down, and then we present what we think are the best to to Mr. Lucas, and then he watches them, and then determines if he agrees with our selections." And I'm like. What you, George Lucas watched my five minute short film, and she's like, "Yeah, he really, really enjoyed the editing. He thought it was. He laughed. He thought it was obviously. He liked it. He got the trophy." And I'm just like, "How do wow. I get a job out of this?" Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, right. And so, yeah. And then Trey made another film uh, after Solo Forever, which I was not a part of, because he came back to Dallas. And he made uh, Jedi Club, which, and so I'm filming in Louisiana and uh, I am working, I'm I'm, uh, setting up some GoPros and shooting some time-lapse stuff of them doing this house move. And I'm with the production assistant, uh, Josh Simmons. And on the drive out there, we're just shooting the shit and everything. And he's like, uh, you know, he's like, you should really check out this, uh, this project I was a part of, you know. Uh, I edited together uh, with this guy named Trey. And I was like, 
what's the project? And he's like, oh, it's called the Jedi Club. I'm like, you got to be shitting me. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, uh, that's a, actually a sequel. He goes, yeah, how do you know that? I'm like, because I did Solo Forever. And he's like, are you kidding me? And I'm like, yeah. So we're in the middle of redneck country, Louisiana, and we meet up together, and he's the one that did the, the second one. And I was just like, what a small yeah. world this is. He's yeah. like, dude, I loved Solo Forever. I was hoping that ours would be you know, almost as good, if not as good. And I was like, dude, it was fantastic. I loved it. It's hilarious. So let me ask you a question with Solo Forever. Do you think because you had basically no idea and no love in the Star Wars universe that that might have helped it? Because you looked at it. How did you look at the story? Did you look at the story like a love story? How did you look at it? I, I didn't. Um, I knew that it was supposed to be funny, but right. I didn't get the jokes. Like when they mm. when we were on set and um, there there's a scene where um he gets a phone call from his girlfriend because she's yeah. she wants to know if he's done the deed and he answers it um he's like uh hey princess and before that han solo's action character is like if it's leia i'm not here kind of thing <laughs> and so when the guys are reading through the script as we're on set they're just roaring at these jokes the the greedo joke the mm -hmm. uh and and all these other jokes and they're just like, man, this is really, really good. And I'm like, okay, let's just, you know, <laughs> can can we shoot this now, kind of thing. And um, it Trey knew, and tr I, again, very, very talented individual, uh, great writer. Um, I I saw Trey. It's been a while now, but I got to see him uh, Christmas Day. We we hung out uh, and had a couple of drinks at his apartment in Dallas. But right. um, he. But you don't feel it was because you directed it, so you had a vision. I consider co-directed because. Okay. Yeah. So that's I, I guess that's what I'm trying to get to is was your vision. I th it was I, his. Okay. He knew so, what he wanted. He knew what he wanted, and he uh, like when we sat when I edited, um, we probably did six different versions of it, just constantly trimming it. I see. Because okay. he 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 knew what he had and he's like man they're gonna love this and i remember um we made a reference to Ve darth vader makes a reference to vegas because uh i don't want to ruin it because it's only five minutes long but um there's a, a line where he's like dude i had to go to rehab you know he's like <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then Darth Vader's like, well, yeah, Vegas is a, it's a crazy city. And he's like, man, I wish I would have put Comic-Con there instead. And that was the only comment that he had after we had done everything. And he's like, I wish we would have recorded that as Comic-Con instead of Comic-Con. Because it would have gotten Vegas. a bigger laugh at Comic-Con sure. than Vegas, uh, I think. Uh. Yeah, I thought Greg would get a kick out of that. That a guy oh, who had check it out. did not it's, care about well, Star Wars ended up winning. The, you know. the well, more and I felt we've like such a guilty dude because I'm wa we're walking around holding this trophy and people are begging to get pictures with the trophy. I got to meet um, Mark Hamill. We got to get a picture with Mark Hamill, Luke Skywalker. Nice. Uh, we stole the picture basically because um, he charges to get stuff autographed or yeah. pictures with. And so we had a friend of ours holding the camera, and we get up there. And um, we get, we're in line. We show him the trophies like, oh, I know these two guys. And then we get the cool picture and they're like, all right, get ready for the picture. And we're like, no, we already got it. Bye bye. And then just took off. <laughs> <laughs> and so I uh, got a picture with uh, Darth Vader and, and stuff. But again, walking all around, people going nuts. Like, how do I get one of those? Like, that is so cool. And we're like, you, you got to win it, you know? And yeah. I felt bad because I'm like, I felt like a, a, a fake, you know, because I'm just like, I don't, I didn't even really know that much about this <laughs> thing. And, you know, like I took your guys' toy, basically. Yeah. I mean, it's just a, <laughs> There have been times when I will just binge fan films. Um, okay. So the more we've talked about it, I'm like, I've seen this. I'm going to go watch it again, but I know I've seen it. Okay. Um, because, I mean, I think it, it speaks to the idea that there are amazing filmmakers that are doing, I mean, in, in the Star Wars universe, they're doing these, these Star Wars uh, short films. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes not even using characters 
from the films. I mean, they're they're either creating their own world or right. like you got you guys did. You created a a fan film about the fans, right? And that's you know, I don't think you need to be a diehard Star Wars fan to to make a good film. Uh, I think what it does stand a testament to is your skills as probably a DP and, and just a filmmaker. So, congrats. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, we, myself and uh, a buddy of mine in L.A., Peter Gaddis, we tried to watch, like, uh, I think when they came out with the eighth one, seventh or eighth, maybe, mm. seventh one, um, we tried to watch all six before the other one came <laughs> out. Like, because I had a 120-inch screen in my apartment in L.A., projection screen, uh, fantastic way to watch movies or play video games and um i slept through the new movie because i was so tired from watching six of them like and we get out of the movie and he's like so what'd you think dude i'm like still superman bro (laughs) Well, the thing about and this is uh, anytime I talk to people about Star Wars and I, I am a pretty big super fan, but I was born in 78. I mean, it, I grew up with it. OK. Yeah, um, yeah. And I also grew up with Superman because my my mom was just a sci fi fan and and, and she uh, made sure I had a pretty even exposure to different kinds of nerddom. So, OK, um, my but, best friend Glenn um, had all the toys. So yeah. I learned Star Wars through him. Mm-hmm. Basically, he recited the movies like you know um <laughs> I can, I can the action that. figures and everything you know yeah. so with, I, I can uh, remember him going yoda's the dude man <laughs> <You know? laughs> with with episodes one two and three which were the kind of the ones that came the out best. And, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> so what i like about those is uh topher grace who from that 70s show and and a good actor a great actor i think but um when he gets off of a project that he just needs to like chill out and take some time he goes in and like just edits films like i as, as a as a, like a thing to do um and he took episodes one two and three uh i think the Episode one came out in like 98. I think it was something like that. Uh, and it's mostly terrible. Uh, that, two came out. With that Jar Jar Binks dude. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's where they premiered him. And yeah, I mean, those, those are not great films. And, and honestly, I don't think any of the Star Wars films are great films. We love them because we love them. Right. Uh, in, in the same way that we love spaghetti Westerns and B movies. I mean, that's mm-hmm. just what mm-hmm. for a lot of us. Um, but he took those first three films and each of those films are like two and a half hours a piece, edited it down to one, like two hour and 15 minute film. It's phenomenal. I mean, oh, he wow. took, he took the cut scenes <laughs> from the DVD and like, just kind of just bunched them all together, made a new edit. Like the first 10 minutes of the film open with the last 10 minutes of episode one. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. It opens up with a Darth Maul fight and you're going, well, this is where we should have started. <laughs> wow. And it's well, it's great. It's called I, the Phantom Cut. When we uh, when we were shooting, um, it's funny you say spaghetti westerns because I wanted uh, the the sequence of the close up as the camera marches in on the eyes of the characters mm-hmm. from Clint Eastwood. Um, you know, so when they're doing the shootout, you know, the camera starts as that wide, but it punches in and moves slowly and slowly to where it's just their eyes on the the screen. And, um, I, I, that's what I wanted to do. Uh, and, and we, we, I think we did okay with it, but, um, I never got as close, a good a shot as I had hoped for their characters faces. Cause again, I was that limited with mil. that 50 yeah. mil. So, but it was, uh, yeah, it was, that was my best week. Uh, that was 2011 because we won, uh, the trophy down in San Diego for that. Um, I won, uh, I was a DP on a web series called Girl Parts, which is hilarious. It's about these four actresses that are roommates that live together that look alike that get called out for the same parts. Oh. <laughs> so you can only imagine the, the humor there. That was fantastic. We won Audience Choice Award for that in Hollywood uh, in, on the Sunset Strip. Awesome. And then I won um, another uh, one that I DP'd and edited called, um, oh, oh. It was a. It it was in Burbank. 
Oh, she's going to kill me. Um, mom, mom fires? Replacing her. Replacing her is what it was called. Replacing. And uh, that yep. one as well. So in six days, I had three projects that won in three different cities. And I was like, oh, that's dude, cool. I'm crushing it. That is cool. That's cool. Uh, and I'm still a waiter. <laughs> <laughs> so well, I, how did I you... Do... Go ahead, Greg. Go ahead. Well, I do want to ask, I mean, um, looking at your resume, there's some things that you've worked on that I just, just as a fan of these different shows I want to ask about. Mm -hmm. um, we were a big fan uh, when he first came on the scene of Duff. And okay. Stuff Duff. And you did some Cake Master stuff. Uh, yes. What was, what was that experience like? Um, I went, if I recall correctly, I went from snakes to cakes. Uh, I did a show, uh, for the discovery yep. channel, yep. um, Actually, called Venom snakes. Hunters. And then we went to, uh, the Ace of Cakes or Cake Master, I believe it was called. Um, same company, authentic entertainment. Oh, okay. They, uh, based in Burbank. Um, I got my first gig with them was a show, um, called flipping out. And my next door neighbor is how I got the gig. He and, uh, another guy were, uh, unloading some gear and taking it from the parking garage of our apartment building into his apartment. And I was like, Hey, you guys need a hand. He's like, no, we got this. And Pat, uh, Pat Albany is his name. And he, uh, he, he's who got me started. He, he was an assistant camera guy who got bumped up to being a cameraman. Mm -hmm. And he's like, dude, um, they're looking for my replacement. Uh, would you be interested in my, and at this point I was working two different restaurants, uh, and, uh, not really doing anything. Um, cause 2011 is like when I felt, you know, great. And then didn't really do much, so to speak, uh, for a little while, uh, because you got to pay bills and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, um, interviewed with Josh Spector, uh, who was the DP of the show, who gave me my first, uh, chance. He, he was the nice. one that said, okay, yeah, well, let's bring this guy on. Um, extremely thankful for that and worked with them and didn't know, like that was my first real professional gig. Um, really? and as far as, uh, network TV kind of thing. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I had done stuff at Sundance, but that was um, um, more documentary stuff than mm -hmm. anything. And so um, worked on that show for, I want to say, four and a half months, but didn't know if I should quit my waitering gig. Sure. So I would work on the TV show Monday through Friday. And then Saturday and Sunday, I was working at home restaurant uh, serving brunch. And I worked four and a half months without a day off, uh, basically, because wow. I didn't know if I was going to be able to, yeah. um, uh, so there's that real fear after. out there. There's that oh, real yeah. fear that you're just going to never get once, back into the industry. Right. Cause you don't know, you know, and, and again, the only guy I knew was, was my next door neighbor, Pat. So I'm working on, um, flipping out and Nick Capadice is the director, um, and one of the producers of the show. Uh, and Nick's from um, Illinois, and uh, he's a diehard Bear fan, which makes him a mortal enemy. And <laughs> um, he, at towards the end, he's like, uh, I got this other gig that we're going to be shooting. Um, would you be interested? And I was like, absolutely, dude. Like, whatever you, you know, I, I want to quit the restaurant job. Yeah, right? yeah. And I don't think I really let too many people know that I was still working at the restaurant. Uh, cause it's kind of embarrassing cause it's, you know, all of them have been in the game, so to speak mm -hmm. for a little bit, you know, and, and you're hoping to, to be in the game. And, um, that was marriage boot camp. Uh, and, and I felt like I was hoping that he liked me cause I did a good job, Yeah. but also part of me felt like he picked me because there's not a lot of guys that talk football on <laughs> sets. <laughs> So, so I was don't, able well, to, like, I don't, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sit there and think that that, that might have a lot to do with it. I mean, yeah, if you yeah. just can just talk, we, that's what we would do. Yeah. You know, is we would talk about it. And now you got to also imagine this, this is when the Packers, you know, the Packers won the Super Bowl 2010, yep. almost went undefeated in 2011. And then the Giants came in um, and did what the Packers did the year before, got hot in the playoffs and won yep. the Super Bowl. Right. 
you know, and, and the bears so, still suck. So yes, the bears will always, and, and they're making great moves by the way. Uh, oh, I know. Jimmy beautiful. Graham. They're beautiful. Uh, but <laughs> so, yeah. So anyway, sorry, uh, this is a long way away from your question. Uh, the cake show, uh, was all through authentic. Like I was lucky enough that I would work on a show, uh, worked with a guy named Mark LaFleur, um, who was the DP basically for authentic. Like he did all of the shows. Now authentic has done, man, 60, 70 different reality shows. They brought you honey boo boo. They brought, I mean, uh, they thanks. Massive. I was just going to say, I was just going to say, Sierra's. um, Hey, you ain't got to like the show. Still, no, no, I hear you. Just gotta, <laughs> yeah, hey, I, I, I want to ask yeah. you real quick about reality TV. Um, when you're dealing with those stars, um, talent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Are is I I picture a reality star thinking they're bigger than they really are compared to like Tom Hanks. Well, they're. Um, it depends on how many seasons you're in. Okay. Mm-hmm. If it's the first season, they're just as hungry as you are, you know, because they're like, this is their one chance and they don't want to blow it, you know? Right. So it's like if, and so that was what was interesting on the marriage boot camp thing was, um, all of these women had been on bridezillas and now we're on marriage because who would have thought that a bridezilla was going to have problems in her marriage later on? Yeah. Right. <laughs> marriage That's, counseling. Yeah. It's shocking to all of us. Yeah, absolutely. And reality uh, TV usually is six to eight weeks, and then you're looking for a new job. Yeah. So, so every two they, months, you're looking for a new job. Is that what happens? These people turn into this is their gig, so they're on seven or five different mm-hmm. types of reality shows yeah. just to keep going? Yeah, because if you're the craziest of the crazies, they're going to bring you back for another season. So like with Marriage Boot Camp, yeah. you're, you're, there were, I remember one incident um, – hearing over the the walkie you know she's got a knife all right cut all right you know because and you're just like because oh, they got into they got into it physically yep. you know but and, are they are they TV, really because we get they, them drunk but are they really getting into it <laughs> or is this just a show so they know that they have a season two coming a little of both okay. i think sometimes yeah. but right. um but then you have like coming on duff's show duff was already established by this mm-hmm. point, he had done seven seasons with Authentic in Church Baltimore. City. Yeah. And then um, they uh, he was in California. He was in Los Angeles and he opened up a cake shop on Melrose and um, got to. And, and that was fascinating. That That's the, the fun thing I love about reality TV. One, the job is never the same. It's never the same mm-hmm. day in and day out. It is a little bit more on your home flipping shows and stuff like that. But the home flipping shows are great because they run much longer, six months. Yeah. So instead of looking for a job every two months, you get on a home show. You know, it, you know you're going to be working for a while because it takes a while to, to do a house. So yeah. you're, are you kind of doing no, a no, – no, no, uh, no. They do a house in an hour. I've yeah, seen. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Forty-four minutes is because uh, of advertising. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's well, and I, I they're the fastest that. Tylers in the world. <laughs> yeah. Um, that six-week thing. I was listening to a podcast with uh, uh, Wendy Wendy McCovey. Uh, she was on Reno Nine One One. She's now the mom on the Goldbergs, and they shot Reno Nine One One like a reality show. So yeah. she was said, uh, yeah, she was working, and, and that was a award-winning hit Comedy Central. Oh, show yeah. Yeah. but they would film a season in in you know a couple weeks so seven eight expensive. weeks it's well yeah so expensive because you're paying all the crew you know and then you're also providing food mm-hmm. um you're paying for location permits parking like i mean there's just so much cost that goes into it that if you can shrink the number of production days down the right. cheaper it's going to be so she was doing that mm-hmm. playing the sexy cop on that show and then she worked at like, like a textile f- factory. Like she was a, I don't want to say maybe she was a seamstress. I'm trying. It was like a a, a pattern catalog kind of place, and mm-hmm. she worked there for like. I mean that show was winning, I believe, Emmys, and, yeah. and she was still holding down that job. Oh yeah. She, for for the very same reason that you're saying, she's like, I don't want to quit because I still have the bulk of a year right. that I need to pay bills. <laughs> Exactly. Wow. You know, they say overnight is five years. Yeah. In LA. So if you're overnight success, uh, it probably took you about five years to try to get to where that is. No shit. If really? you're lucky. Yeah. I didn't know that. 
But yeah. that I guess that makes sense, you know, like it's, it's all about meeting the right people, you know. Um had I not moved so my first apartment that I lived in in LA, um I I shared an apartment with a woman, LaDawn Lawrence, uh, for almost a year, was working at a restaurant, uh, Morel's Steakhouse at the Grove, which is closed down now. And um, then I moved in with one of the other guys that I worked with at the restaurant, Jordan, and um, lived in that apartment for maybe two years and then moved basically around the corner, two two apartment buildings down uh, from that apartment building. And uh, easiest move I've ever done because I just put everything <laughs> on my desk chair and rolled it down the sidewalk. <laughs> and so it was fantastic. And moved into that building and lived there for a while before I became friends with Pat, who got me the start, really. You know, mm-hmm. um, so it's that's that's what takes the longest amount of time is trying to meet the right people. You know, because a lot of people um, will network and go to the bars and stuff like that. That's great for actors and stuff like that. But if you're trying to do camera work and stuff, you got to be on set early the next morning. You Mm -hmm. don't want to get drunk or anything because, you know, always in the back of mind, in your mind, you know, they can replace you because there's Mm -hmm. other people that are begging to be able to just, you know, be a production assistant. You're not the face of the show. (laughs) Yeah. And even if you are the face of the show. Um, I mean, Charlie Sheen, you know, when I first got to LA, I was doing a lot of extra work, uh, a lot of extra work because yes, like, that's uh, true. the Island, uh, the Island. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. two and a half men. Uh, wait, can I, you real quick, just give us the look you gave on the Island. <laughs> I don't think I can recreate that again without Michael Bay. Oh, uh, I, for this simple oh, this reason, is what you did, Darren, this is awesome. You went, <laughs> well, that was take two. Here, here's the <laughs> story for that. Two. Yeah, so there's 400 of us extras, and uh, they're setting it up, and and Bay picked me, which I was stunned by, you know. Um, I worked on that for four or five days. And uh, so he's like, all right, here's what you're going to do. I'm going to, uh, you're going to be looking up that way, and then there's going to be an announcement, and you're going to turn towards the camera uh, with this oh shit look on your face. I was like, okay, I can do that. So we do the first take. He's like, cut. All right, we're going to do that again. I'm going to move you over just a few inches so that you feel the frame a little better. I'm like, all right, cool. So we do that, and he you know, calls action. And when I do the turn, my arm hits the barn door of the camera. So the camera has uh, a <laughs> mat box, yeah, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, to keep light from hitting the lens at different angles. So it's called the mat box, and then on the mat box are barn doors so they can shift and adjust how they want mm-hmm. the light to come in or whatever. So when I hit that barn door, that oh shit look was for real. Because <laughs> I thought, fuck, I'm getting kicked off this movie. My career is over because I look at all of the camera people that are behind it, and they're just like shaking their heads like fucking idiots. And I'm like, oh, God. And and. And Bay goes, all right, perfect, moving on. And I'm just like, huh, glad, I, glad I could help. <laughs> <laughs> but he knew what he was doing. Like, he knew what he wanted, and he knew how to get it. You yeah, know? You know what's funny? I remember um, watching the island, and okay. I remember Ursula and I were watching it, and I go, wait a fucking minute. <laughs> and she goes, what? what? And, I, and I rewound it. I go, who does that look like to you? She goes, is that your friend Darren? I'm like, I think that fucking is Darren. Yeah. And that's when I called you. I was like, dude, were you on the island? Yes. And you're like, what island? And I'm like, no, no, the <laughs> movie. And you're like, oh, yeah. I'm like, thanks for telling me, dick. You were yeah. supposed to tell well, me things like this. And then he called me. He's like, have you seen the island? <laughs> yeah, of course I've seen the island. He's like, did you see Darren? I'm like, <laughs> what was I supposed to? Wait, he's like, he's go to this scene. I'm, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, look there he is. <laughs> I, I have the clip uh, saved on my phone, and I've slow motioned it so it's four <laughs> seconds. Created a gift on just it. so that I could, you know, be proud of it. Um, yeah, I did a lot of extra work. Uh, that's um, I was doing that and waiting tables. And so, um, what I loved about the extra work uh, was that it was the easiest way to get onto a production you know because you didn't need to know anybody and with short hair and military background and stuff um 
when you go into central casting, they take your, you take your 25 bucks and they take your picture and you fill out this form of, you know, your height and everything. And they want to know all your measurements and everything, you know? So, um, then you go across the street, uh, to extras management. So what happens is, is you got to call every single day, this phone line, hoping to get through to listen to the voicemail to see if you, if there's a show that looks for somebody as your type. Mm. Now you can hire a company called extras management, which will do all that for you. So they basically get what they need for extras from all of the shows yeah. and then they will book you. And then whatever is left over goes to the central casting phone line. So mm. extras management was booking uh, me and I was working, you know, five, sometimes six days a week because, um, I could be a fireman. I could be a policeman. I, I was a fireman. I was a doctor. I've been a paramedic, you know, all kinds of yeah. different stuff. And, um, like I said, they know, uh, sizes and everything. I, I was standing in line for desperate housewives. We got called in, we're filming a restaurant scene and there's like 75 people in line and I'm just standing there. And these two women, which I later find out are the, the, production manager and the wardrobe lady come walking up and they, she stops at me and she goes, you, you're a 32 inch waist and a 32 inch inseam, aren't you? And I was like, yeah, how would you know? She's like, it's my job to know. Follow me. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Wow. Yes, ma'am. So I'm marched up. Well, it turns out the guy that they had for, to be a cook in that episode didn't show up that day. So all of a sudden I'm in a scene with Bob Newhart and Terry Hatcher nice. uh, as the, the line cook behind Bob Newhart in that scene only because I was the right size because mm -hmm. I fit the costume yeah. uh, that they had wow. already slipped out. Yeah. Wow. So it's that crazy. Wow. So going back to uh, the reality, um, mm -hmm. what was your favorite shoot? Was it Venom Hunters? Was it flipping out? Like what, what was your favorite? Uh, it's hard to say. Let me see. Um, I don't know if I can really, I, I know this is cheesy, but I, it's hard to say a favorite because I enjoy what I'm doing for the most part. Right. Um, there are tough days, like Venom Hunters, it's 112 degrees out in the Arizona desert and you're out there trying to find snakes. Um, that's, you know, you're like, and this, there's gotta be an easier way to make a living than this <laughs> kind of thing. But at the same time, you're like, dude, I'm like, I'm living the dream. Like, you know, yeah. um, any Did close you think calls you'd on go Venom this way? I'm sorry. Go What's ahead, that? Greg. I say any close calls on Venom Hunters when you were doing that? Any any freakouts? Any? Um, there was a freakout. Uh, a couple. Uh, there was one. Um, I was further away from the action because I don't like snakes. So, <laughs> so a lot of times when we were filming like stuff, I was on the super long lens, so the 100 to 400. So mm. I was like way back you know i'm talking 30 yards 50 you know 40 mm -hmm. yards sometimes and and they're like you know, you got that i'm like yep got got it right here <laughs> you know <laughs> and i remember one time um they're pulling the snake out of a hole and threw it basically and it it, it hit the one camera dude in the leg and i'm just like yeah i don't want to be that close to the action <laughs> why were they you doing know? that to just they get were the snake, the snake. yeah because they would catch these snakes and then they would milk the the venom from them, right. and cause that hence the name venom hunters. And what they use the venom for uh, is for antibiotics. Yeah. But um, they at Arizona State University they are breaking down the chemical compounds and using it for heart disease and other treatments, mm. oh. which is crazy. Yeah. And that's what I love about doing reality TV is um, you get to learn, you know. Uh, all these different things. Like yeah. I didn't know what fond it was until the cake show and <laughs> you no, know, don't eat it. And, um, and with the, the snake show, like you are with snake experts. So, mm -hmm. and you're out, you know, hours of time hiking through the, the desert and stuff. And you get a lot of time that you're not filming, you know, cause you're trying to get to where we can find a snake. Right. And, um, you get to ask these experts all the questions you mm -hmm. want. Like, I felt like I was like an annoying seven year old kid being like, so like, what's the worst snake? And what's, you know, like, why yeah, that, is the Western diamondback different than the Eastern diamondback snake? That would be my son. 
Yeah. Oh, dude, it's watching amazing. those shows. Yeah. 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 You know, and they don't obviously use a lot of or any of that, you know, but you get to ask these people that are at the top of the game, like, dude, like this is amazing how how did this happen? You know, wow. it's cool. Yeah. You know what I'm thinking, Darren? You okay. should you should definitely start a podcast. Oh. <laughs> and like I think you have enough connections and enough stories. You can bring on Marines. You could talk about your, you know, what you're doing now. You definitely definitely could be start a great something. documentary. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because I already I already have the establishing shot, which I know is gonna probably gross out a lot of people. Um because so on Tuesday, June first of two thousand four. So when uh, when you and I were roommates in yeah. Lake Geneva, yeah, and um, uh, then you had moved out, and and I was waiting tables and right. partying, and did that for like three or four years. Yep. And then um, was that when Kim volleyball? Isn't that when Kim told you to, hey, we're leaving, get your ass to L.A. with us or something like yes. that? Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. Kim um, Palazzo. Was, Kim Palazzo. That was the yeah. second time I went to LA. The first time um, I went. So that Tuesday, June 1st, we were playing volleyball at uh, in Elkhorn, two seasons bowling alley. And I, the tendon that connects your kneecap down to your shin, um, that tendon, a lot of, for most people, it tears. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, it broke off the bone and my kneecap slid six inches up my thigh. Underneath uh, the side. Okay. And it didn't hurt. I didn't, I didn't feel it. So I'm laying on the ground and I'm like, why am I laying on the ground? Like, you know, and so I go to roll up to stand up and I bring my knees to my chest and my lo- lower right leg is just dangling. And then uh, the kneecap <laughs> is this big hunk of thing under, you know, I'm like, what is that? And the Marine Corps always told you, you know, if you break a bone or whatever, just snap it back so that you can get out of the area in case you're in a combat zone, you know? Mm. So I don't know why, but I straightened out the lower leg with my left hand and with my right hand, I shoved that kneecap back down. And then that's when I rolled over in the sand and cried. Uh, like a little girl, cause it, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure. So, um, that's where the sh- opening shot would be the opening. No, the opening shot is, uh, after they did the surgery, I had the surgery at the VA hospital in Madison. Um, they had put all these staples. So I had a hip brace from my, uh, hip all the way down to my ankle. And I had to wait, uh, for the bone to heal for two months before I could start the physical therapy. So I was out for four months. I had to learn how to walk again. And so I came back to work at Popeye's in Lake Geneva, um, yeah. in October. And then January, uh, I moved to LA, uh, or outside of LA for the first time. Um, my buddy, Mike Easton, uh, who's a judge in Kenosha now, um, was dating a, a brain surgeon and she had, he had brought her to, uh, lunch at Popeye's after I had come back to work and, um, he made the comment to her. He's like, you know, Darren's always talked about going to LA and she's like, well, um, I got a room if you want to move into the house and live with three hot female brain surgeons. And so I moved to Redlands, California. And does it not sound like a sitcom? Does yeah. it not sound like Dude, a sitcom? Dude, I felt like Jack Tripper, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, um, the footage of the, the, the start of the documentary is them pulling the staples out of my knee. And uh, I filmed it with a little handy cam and I have, I still have no feeling in most in, in my knee, but the last few staples, um, I got great audio. So you hear the flesh tearing as he's got the pliers <laughs> pulling the staple out. You see the camera do this ah! and you hear me. Ah! <laughs> and, uh, so that I want to start the, the documentary from black no credits or anything, just that opening scene with the sound, and then boom, graphics. So you want to be a filmmaker <laughs> and, and <laughs> tell the story of all the crazy shit I've done to try to get to Good. being a wow. film. Wow. What's the uh, what's the one thing that um, people don't realize about reality TV? 
Uh, they forget the second half of that equation. It's that is television. TV. Yeah, that's right. Oh, that's just TV. like show that's business. Problem. You know, okay. show business. It's business. Yeah. Reality TV. It's TV. Okay. So, is it all real? Uh, eh. it's, it's some I can't really say because I sign NDAs. Yeah. But what, what uh, is real? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. What is real? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But re- uh, the television part of it, definitely, uh, because you still got to make a show. Yeah. Now, you know? I do want to bring those because uh, what I noticed the most, and, and we, you and I are friends on Facebook, so I get to see your feed. Um, you take some amazing photography, too. And I, the, the stuff you've done in Green Valley Ranch, the stuff I've seen from New Orleans. I'm a big Texas fan. I love Austin. So some of your Austin shots. Um, is that just something you're doing on the side or is that part of your corporate gigs? Or Because you really make the colors. I mean, they, they just pop. I mean, I love yeah. it. So um, when I went back to Whitewater, so... Mm-hmm. In 2004, um, or 2005, January 2005, I moved out to Redlands, California, and and was out there for about four or five months, then came back to Wisconsin, because Lynn, she had sold the house, and she was taking it, they were in their final year of residency, so for brain surgeons, they go to school for seven years after Mm -hmm. school, and so um, Dr. Netta Jafari was taking a position, I think, in New Jersey. Lynn was in Philadelphia, and Dr. Gaina Breelin was uh, stayed in Southern California. And so um, when she sold the house, I didn't really know anybody. And so my thought was, I'll just go back to Wisconsin, uh, make a bunch of money in Lake Geneva uh, during the summer, and then uh, come back out uh, yeah. in the fall. Um, and instead, I went back to school in 2006. And finally finished in 2008. And then that's when I moved with Kim Palazzo and her brother. She had contacted me and said, hey, I've got stuff that I'm moving from my L.A. storage or my storage unit in Milwaukee out to San Diego. Um, Can you come help me load up the stuff? So I drove up there and then jokingly said, you know, there's enough room on your truck to load my apartment. And she goes, well, why don't why don't you do it? And I was supposed to start a job in Milwaukee for Orem Design doing commercials. And instead, I took the chance because we went to lunch and um, I only knew one person in the industry, if you will, um, that I had met at Sundance. I filmed the Sundance red carpet events for four years Mm. and met this uh, husband and wife um, over a Bloody Mary. And it turned out he was... Uh, Richard Jastro, he was vice president of post-production at Paramount and his wife, Marcy. Nice. And so I called, Kim was like, you need to call Marcy. And uh, I was like, all right. So I called Marcy and um, it went to voicemail. And Kim's like, before we leave, before we're done lunch, Marcy's going to call you back. I'm like, uh, we'll see, whatever. And it was like a scene out of a movie. She, the waitress is hmm. handing the plate down and I get the phone call. And I said, Marcy, I got a chance to move to L.A. right now. Um, What do you think I should do? I'm supposed to start this job. And she's like, well, you got to ask yourself. You want to make commercials in Milwaukee? You want to make movies in Hollywood? Mm -hmm. And so Hmm. uh, I woke up at 930 that morning across the street from Topper's Pizza on Milwaukee Avenue in Whitewater. Mm -hmm. Uh, And at 9 o'clock that night, not even 12 hours later, the the apartment was empty. I called my mom and said, hey, I'm... I'm moving. She's like, yeah, I know you're moving to Milwaukee. I said, no, nah, I'm, I'm moving to L.A. <laughs> she's like, what? When? And I said, now. And she's like, so they came up and uh, helped me pack. And I was on the road the next day. Wow. And um, that was the second time. Wow. And so it was pretty crazy. Mm-hmm. So uh, Ursula wanted to know this with your photography. Mm-hmm. Do you use anything specific like on a Mac? Is there some sort of program that you use to... Sorry um, to you're... sorry to ignore your question, Greg, and hopefully answer <laughs> the question, Johnny, at the same time because you had just asked about the photography and everything. Um, so what I do is when I went back to college at Whitewater in 2006, uh, I took a photography class by Dennis mm-hmm. Dale. And oh yeah, I I'm in Dennis. there, um, and one of the other students, uh, John Christensen. Um, uh, the mm-hmm. professor was showing us photos that he had taken down in, I think it was in Belize. And John makes the comment. He's like, oh, I wonder what those would look like uh, as HDRs. 
And the professor was like, HDR? And I'm like, what is HDR? And so we Googled it, and HDR is high dynamic range photography. So you lock the camera down on a tripod. You take a series of images. Um, I usually work with five. And, they, and you program the camera so that it um, adjusts the exposure value um, so that what I'll do is I have a self-timer um, so that there's no vibration of the camera whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And it'll take a picture and then it'll do a minus two exposure and then a minus and then it'll wait two seconds, take another picture. Then it'll take a minus one, wait two seconds, take another picture, plus one, plus two. I take those five images. I take them into a program called Photomatics Pro. And that basically takes all the good stuff of each of those images and creates one single image. And then from that, I export that from as a raw file, uh, as a TIFF file. And then I take that into um, Photoshop and I do about 20, 25 adjustments to the photograph in Photoshop. And what gives you all the color and pop and everything is I, real big secret, I adjust the saturation by 30%. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So um, I do, like I said, I do about 25 or 30 adjustments, but the biggest one that that gives you the pop is the adjustment of the saturation because I love the color. Yeah, very I, cool. it's it's very cool. I I like a lot of what uh, it t- comes out as. And, and my daughter, I'm I'm taking some notes here for my daughter because she is a student of photography. She's she's got her own uh, HD SLR camera. I mean, she just she was doing stop motion animation when she was like eight years old with her oh, Barbie wow. dolls. Yeah, it was actually she was getting to the point, and I'm just gonna play off of this. Uh, she was getting to the point where like most of your friends are starting to kind of grow out of dolls. Do you think maybe I go (laughs) and I start to go to her room and I see she's taking like all the boxes and making dioramas and making sense. And then I go through her camera and I'm literally just clicking through at high speed. She's making, she's doing story. She's doing, and I'm like, that's awesome. Oh my God. I'm like, I will buy you as many dolls as you want. Let's go. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, dolls she's... are cheaper than actors because one, you don't have to feed them. <laughs> so, and they listen; they take better yeah. direction than actors so, do. So, uh, I show her yeah. some of your stuff, and she's like, "That's really cool. How does he do that?" And I'm like, "I'll ask." Um, I would recommend. Uh, there's a, a, a bunch of different photographers that I follow. Uh, Trey Ratcliffe. Um, he was the first photographer to have an HDR image in the Smithsonian. Ooh, uh, he cool. sells a tutorial. Um, but you can watch tutorials and stuff online. YouTube is by far the greatest teacher uh, university yeah. right now, honestly. Yeah. Um, but Trey Ratcliffe, uh, I like, uh, Casey Neidstadt does a, a oh, really? show on YouTube. Uh, he doesn't do a tutorial about photography, but I like watching his style of, uh, filmmaking. Um, yeah. also, uh, Peter McKinnon is a huge one from Canada. And then, um, probably my favorite. Uh, other my favorite living photographer um peter lick he's an australian and um he has i want to say around 10 or 12 studios a few like three or four studios in vegas that's where he's Mm. based now because vegas is great because it's so close to yosemite you're Mm -hmm. close to zion park i mean you're within four to six hours of other places but um there's so many different places you can go from vegas in any direction that is a completely different landscape than where you are. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and he has sold, I want to say four or five of the top 10 most expensive prints ever sold. Wow. He's got the world record for selling one print, uh, for, I want to say it was like $10 million for one photo. Wow. Yeah. So, but some people claim that because it was a silent auction, did he buy his own photo, <laughs> raise up the price? I don't know, but his stuff is fantastic. Um, and so those are some guys that I would definitely recommend uh, checking out as far as photography. Cool. Because um, Trey, I watched, I mean, I, I, I learned the HDR stuff uh, while I was at Whitewater. And um, then what I love about reality TV, the other thing that I love about reality TV is as a photographer or camera guy, my paint palette is huge because I have worked mm. with so many other photographers and directors of photography. So if you think of a paint palette 
as okay so i have white paint where i have peter lick right here and then mm -hmm. i have a little bit of peter mckinnon over here and i have a little bit of this and right. if i blend and mix those paints or photographers mm -hmm. or their art forms because every photographer looks at the world differently than you do so that's the other great thing about working with other camera dudes because i'm like oh i would have never set that shot up that way but i like what you did here mm -hmm. and i'm gonna use that uh and get better you know constantly yeah. trying to find a different angle or a different way to look at mm -hmm. photography because that's all movies are you know they're motion pictures right they're Absolutely. pictures you know and so for me um uh, my dream is uh to do a traveling photography show like i would love to be the anthony bourdain of photography uh, oh, that's i would cool. love to do a show where each because one, there are more photographers in the world today than there's ever been because mm -hmm. everyone has a phone in their camera yep. in, in, or in their pocket on their cell phone. So um, you, ha you know, thousands and millions and millions of people are photographers, you know. And um, what I love is there's so many different styles of photography mm -hmm. because you got crime scenes. Like, how do you shoot a crime scene photo, mm -hmm. you know, because you got to get that right because that's going to be used in a court case. You have food photography. You have high fashion runway photography. Like you have macro photography. How do you take right. a picture of a, a little bug? How do you get mm -hmm. a picture through a microscope? You know, and I think that um, a show like that would obviously be very entertaining to other photographers uh, because I became a nerd. You know, I might mm -hmm. not have been a nerd for Star Wars, but I became a nerd about photography. And everybody's so, a nerd about something. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Exactly. Have you and pitched that show to anybody? I, I want to shoot it myself. Okay. And so what I'm hoping with the 50 push up thing is I'm going to document that. Sure. And um, and I'm hoping that that'll be my way in because there's there's all different types of ways to make it in Hollywood. Yeah. Each one is unique. Yeah. You know, there's well, maybe, not a maybe, maybe now with, I don't know, with, with streaming and YouTube, you don't really need Hollywood. No, um, you know? I, I did a, I did four episodes of a show flipping moms, flipping yeah. moms was a, a house flipping show with these two moms. They got the show because they had a following on YouTube. Yeah. Like yeah. that's how they got. There's noticed. a kid, there's a kid that, that million, makes, I think 20 million an episode or 20 oh, million yeah. a year opening up toys. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's where they're going. Mm -hmm. That's where production companies are going because they've already got the built in audience. Right. Like, oh, you Makes got, sense. You, yeah. you got a million subscribers. All right. Let's, let's see what you, you know. Right. And so you see a lot of bloggers or vloggers that are getting their own shows, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. um, look at dude. Perfect. Right. Yeah. Dude. Perfect. Those guys, they're based in Dallas right. and started off just, you know, what is trick five shots. guys just yeah. doing trick yeah. shots in right. college and right. they are an empire yep. there's they make more money from their advertising on their youtube channel than they did from the network show that they got <laughs> you know and so um i i produced a, a project called the yale project uh co-produced it um with barbara bragg and jane petroff and it was how does an actor come to Los Angeles and book as a TV show regular? Hmm. So we did this all self-financed. Uh, started with one single camera, then we got a second camera, then we got a third camera. And we interviewed um, producers, directors, actors, talent agents, all these people in the business um, on how to do it. And the overall theme was if you can make something that people like, they're going to mm -hmm. make Hollywood come to you because – they will pay more. You know, they're not going to, they don't want to hear, you're not going to go in necessarily and pitch an idea uh, to a show unless you have contacts in the industry. Yeah. Well, if you make your own product and people like it, they're going to come yeah. to you and yeah. then that's no. where you're going to get really paid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So I'm hoping um, the photography thing, that's why I want to do the push up thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, to not only bring awareness for veteran suicide, but also because I think that I can show America because I'm telling you right now, once we get through this, uh, disease, mm -hmm. people are going to want to get outside. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Huge for sure. summer. For sure. You know, good luck trying to get tickets to, um, half, Anything. Dome, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah. And so that's what I'm hoping is to to travel around the country and just show people how beautiful this country is. And that's why, like when you were asking um, about, do I take photos on the road? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Whenever I'm whenever I'm in a city, um, I have to go out and and shoot, even if it's only for an hour. Mm-hmm. My thought is. That's what, even if I only get one good picture, that's one more picture that I have now that I didn't have before. Yeah. You know? And so, and it's always an adventure because it's fun getting kicked off a parking structure by security. Yeah. <laughs> you can't shoot that here. Oh, really? Uh, all, right. all right. I'll leave. I already got what I need. But yeah, yeah. Bye. Yeah. You know? I well, did that in Phoenix recently. Yeah. Nice. You know? Yeah. As the Marine Corps says, uh, never a- it's easier to f- ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. <laughs> permission. Yep. That's not only the Marine Corps. That's <laughs> pretty much everywhere. That's yep. that's uh, prior planning prevents piss poor performance. There you go. That sounds more <laughs> Marine Corps. <laughs> All right, man. I think we'll end it there. Sorry um, for talking so long, boys. No, no, oh, Darren. Yes. <laughs> Darren, this was super cool. I appreciate you getting on. I appreciate you. Gosh, just diving into the history of what you like and what uh, the Marine Corps, the uh, the camera work, the directing, the photography. Um, we still got to get you in the movie you were supposed to be in in my short film. Do you know about this, Greg? So I did a <laughs> short do? film do uh, called um, called Taking a Shot. All right, uh, it was my first short film shot with the great John Faust. Oh he yes, was the camera guy, yep. listener Rick of Penzik. our show actually. Yeah, Rick Penzik was. Uh, oh, John. In, uh, he was, um, he was a, a a rookie cop. Um, <laughs> Rick is like I hope to make it big someday so that I can show the behind the scenes <laughs> stuff of Rick Penzik because <laughs> he is the best ad libber that I've ever known. Wow. Uh, he's fantastic. But I had written this short film, uh, and it was supposed to star John Johnny Angel. Johnny Angel the Third uh, was supposed to be this uh, hitman from Atlanta, and um, we filmed it in Lake Geneva. And so, from the short, I came up with a trilogy. Really, uh, the first film is called would be titled "Taking a Shot." It's uh, basically five stories in a bar in one night, and we follow the shot glass as the character. Oh, different, okay. That's the connection between the different stories. Nice. So you have a guy celebrating his divorce that day with his buddies, and they're just getting ripped. They bumped into the bachelorette party. And then you also got the female pool hustler. You got the big, big drug deal going down in the back between the blacks, the Russians, the Mexicans, and the Chinese. And <laughs> right, um, then you got a guy that's just trying. Yeah. And then you got... um a guy that's just trying to get laid at the bar. And so everybody's taking a shot. You know? huh. Not only metaphorically speaking with yeah. the shot glass, right. yeah, no, but I, in I, life, you know? Yeah. And so... Do you still have all this footage? Uh, I have the, the short film, yeah, definitely. Okay. And, I, and, Greg, in the, I wasn't in, the in movie, this. No, he's not. Oh, okay. So, so he was supposed to be in this. He, I yeah. was hoping that he would come up from Atlanta. And so the line in the short film is, oh, where's a... Johnny at? And he's like, okay. oh, Johnny couldn't make it. He's still in Atlanta. So then the f- second movie is about the hitman that comes in yeah. and takes out uh, these guys. And then the third movie, I w- and that one is just called um, Badass. And then the, the third movie would just be titled Johnny. And we don't know who Johnny, we hear about Johnny in the mm-hmm. first and second films. But he is trying to make weed legal. So he's got politicians in his bo- uh, pocket and everything. And so he controls the drug trade from Dallas all the way around Florida up to Atlanta. And so um, I wrote this uh, and started shooting it in Lake Geneva uh, back in 2005 when I mm-hmm. wasn't as good a camera guy and everything. But the city of Lake Geneva let us uh, shut down the road. Um, they let Whoa. me go at the Riviera. Nice. Uh, I had to go to the city council and all that stuff. But uh, all because of the character, uh, Johnny Angel, the badass. <laughs> so uh, someday I'm going to say, you know, I got this career because of this guy, Johnny Angel, whose dad played for the Bears. Yeah. And sacked by the way, by the way, whatever, whatever you've accomplished, that's on you, man. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, your, that's your hard work. That's not. You re- um, you remember- I was just cheering you on. I was just cheering you on. <laughs> well, you remember. Uh, 
uh, shooting coming home. I do, of course. The, the Getch joke that we played with the the underwear. Yes. <laughs> you can tell Greg that uh, off <laughs> I was... that story. It's <laughs> glorious. Yeah. Getch doesn't think so. No, but... Of course he does. Of course he does. <laughs> but um, yeah. So I think we will definitely end there. All right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, we end every episode with a fact of the day. Okay. Um, so let's randomly generate that and see what comes up. Okay. We talked about this guy, actually. Many personal checks written by Marlon Brando were often never cashed as his signature was usually worth more than the amount on the check. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Marlon Brando. Yeah. Man, that, that guy, I don't know if I'd ever it's it's funny because he was a super talented guy, but I would not want the reputation he had. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Listen watch Superman and then mm-hmm. listen to the audio commentary yes. of yes. Richard Donner talking yeah. about Marlon Brando. He wasn't how, the only one. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh same with uh Francis Ford Coppola. You ever one of my fa- I, I, oh, documentaries are my down. favorite. Yes, yeah, documentaries down. are my favorite um, form of filmmaking because it's yeah. it's real. Like I'm that's starting, Tiger to, really, King is so I'm starting good. to really dive into documentaries, so mm-hmm. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, into the heart of darkness. Yes, watch Check it. that out because yeah. you see Francis Ford Coppola. Like this is a guy. Uh, his main actor had a heart attack during the filming. Right. Mm-hmm. You know. Right. And then Brando shows up. And he was supposed to have lost all this weight, and he shows up like sixty pounds heavier yeah. than yeah. he was supposed to yeah. do. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, <laughs> I remember watching a lot of Brando because uh, we had to take that film class. Remember mm-hmm. that we had to take that film yep. class. And I remember he put he put Brando on three or four times during that film class, and I thought I don't get it. I don't because yeah. you couldn't understand. see the acting. Yeah, that was, I was the like, thing. I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't understand why this guy's considered one of the greatest of all time. Mm-hmm. I never got it. Um, right. But, I mean, you and I, we've had many conversations of who we thought the best actors were. But that's, yep. that's, that's another podcast. But, yeah, again, I'm available. Uh, again. I'm not working. <laughs> Unfortunately. Right. Um, so I'm available for a while, uh, it appears. But, yeah, yeah we did. We, we, I remember when we were in Lake Geneva and the audio cut out on Dude, Where's My Car? And we got more laughs from the audience making up lines. <laughs> That's right. That's movie. right. God, I remember that oh. now. <laughs> yes, Greg, the audio <laughs> cut out on the movie theater. And we're sitting there, Darren and I, and we're both acting the guy's parts. Like, yeah. you know, ever doing that ad lib thing that you uh-huh. do? Oh, my I, God. I remember you telling me that because you came oh. in and you, you came back and you're like, one Never go see this movie. Yeah. Two. Here's what happened when we saw this movie. <laughs> there's there's two movies that I've seen with Mr. Angel that uh, I believe the other movie was Battlefield Earth. Oh, uh, uh, oh that God. Mr. Angel took me to. And uh, what I recall about that, not the movie, obviously, but Mr. Angel uh, saying, you know, I rate movies basically one of two ways: either a, it was worth the money in the park popcorn. Or B, you should pay me that money back. Yeah. And Battlefield Earth, no they matter. should also pay for your parking, gas, yeah. babysitter. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, yeah. right, I agree. It that was, was supposed to be like a trilogy, according oh, to dude. <laughs> well, and, That was and, supposed and, to be a big thing. You were a huge Travolta fan, if I recall. Yeah, because of Face Off. Huge. and yeah. yeah. Oh, dude. Pulp Fiction. Um, yeah. Pulp Fiction. Not, yeah. not much of an L. Ron Hubbard fan, though. So, no. That's no. Much. And, and I lived across the street from their Scientology Celebrity Center in Hollywood. That's where my apartment is. Is oh. like they had he bought this, they bought this enormous castle uh, in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And um, I know I'm talking again That's too right. long, That's but right. they have an event. Uh, I don't know if they still do, but they had an event every year, and they would block off the street. We weren't. They, they would um, not let us park our cars in front of our own apartment building, they would shut everything down and then they would put up a uh, black plastic wrap, like walls so that you couldn't even see. But I lived on the second floor so I could look over the wall and stuff. And they would have this enormous event, Tom Cruise mm-hmm. uh, right. and, and John Travolta would show up there. 
and uh but yeah it was you, you want to see some crazy documentaries yep. those yes. are some crazy documentaries. Yep. Those are going nuts. clear i think is is the one yeah that's yeah right yeah. or even but, listen to leanne remy yeah yeah she oh, talks on yeah. uh joe rogan's podcast she's gone on other radio shows and i'm corolla things mm-hmm. like that crazy yeah. stuff i i had gone over there and and Ask them she did. If I she would did. if they would let me shoot pictures there because the property is so gorgeous. Yeah. And then I sat in the lobby for what seemed like forever. It was probably maybe fifteen minutes, and I was like, and and waiting for somebody to come out to talk to me, and no one did. And then I just I was like, oh, I'm all right. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks a lot, Derek. Okay. Thank you. you yeah. On. This is this is um, fun. This is yeah. Fun. Encourage your daughter, man. I will encourage, absolutely. You know, yeah. obviously. Uh, they're the next generation of filmmakers. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and uh, especially their age because they have the time to do it, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And so they can make the mistakes now before they get on set somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Who All knows? Right, we'll leave it at that. We'll leave it at she that. Could be, she could be doing, you know, Barbie shows on YouTube and, God, I and, so. and then you ain't got to pay for college. That's so. right. There you go. There you <laughs> there go. go. All right, guys. guys. Uh, Darren, thank you so much. Thank you. Johnny, uh, thanks. Uh, thank you. If you guys have listened, I think we're on around, around a three hour podcast or something Ooh, like hey. that. Yeah. So um, if you guys hung out this long, thank you very much for listening. <laughs> yes. Thank and, you. Uh, and we'll talk again. Catch you later. All right. Bye.